Um, we're gonna roll right on into um, our museum five minutes. I've just lost my doc. What just happened? My, oh no, um, my word crashed that had my introduction to describe who Becky is. So that's terrible. I have, <laughs> but what I can tell you about Rebecca Quinton, because I, I know her, something really strange has happened here for me. Um, is that, uh, oh, I do have it. Well, I can tell you that Becky's the person who trained me to look at garments. I was gonna publicly thank her. Anyway, I have it here. I was gonna publicly thank her as part of her introduction because um, she is the person who taught me to make donuts and baguettes for packing dresses and how to unpack them and how to look carefully at them. And so I owe a great deal to Rebecca Quinton, who is the, um, she is, are you still research manager? Are you still doing that? I thought that was going to wrap up after the burl open. <laughs> uh, it was only supposed to be for two years. I'm now clocking six and a half. Gosh, well, sometimes when you're made the curator of, of costume, you end up doing other things. So your curatorial remit is European dress and textiles, including medieval to early modern tapestries, embroideries, lace at the Burl Collection. Um, Becky's curated numerous displays and exhibitions, including a dress to die for, how fashion was changed by technology at the People's Palace, Century of Style, which was fantastic at the Kelvin Grove. And currently your, your research includes 19th century dress and textile manufacturers, legacies of slavery and empire and Scottish wedding outfits when you're not managing the research remit for all of Glasgow museums for six years. Becky, tell us more, please. Uh, thank you, Robin, that's a lovely introduction. Um, uh, yes, don't ever be persuaded to go for an acting up post is, is the lesson learned there. So yes, uh, Glasgow Museums traditionally called the costume collection, but as I head back to my substantive post, we have changed it to dress. Uh, I'm still not entirely sure how large the collection is. Curators will know the issue with digital documentation is have we counted a dress as one dress or three parts of a dress in terms of our numbers, but I think we've got over a thousand to possibly 2000 for 19th century. Overall, the dress and textile collection is 20,000 plus. Today, for time, I'm just going to focus on the dress, not the textiles. So, yes, the two exhibitions I focused on, one was on technology, one was on colour, which is also just an excuse to get a fantastic range out and photographed. None of the collection had been photographed before to digital standards. Um, so this was from a century of style. As you'd expect, we're a local authority museum, so we are generally reliant on donations and therefore the majority of it is women's wear, vast majority of it, but we do have some men's wear, which includes sports wear, which I've classified as its own little sub collection, outer wear, um, and the main survivor for 19th century men's wear are waistcoats. Some with local labels, this beautiful one here by a London tailor or Henry Poole. We, as many collections will have, we'll have the hatches, matches and dispatches. Uh, uh, we have got a really nice collection of Victorians, children's wear, mainly toddlers and infants. And obviously here being Southwest Scotland, there is a high number of Ayrshire long gowns, short gowns and caps. So this is Ayrshire white work, which is defined by having the needle lace within the embroidery on glaze, the white work. We have women's wear over 300 dresses from kind of five from the first decade to over 50 for each decade later on, which of course includes a high percentage of wedding dresses. They are what's kept in the attic for future generations to donate. Um, during lockdown, I finally got cracking and did a, started on the provenance research of these. Scotland, lots of the books are written about Wedding dresses are based on English. In Scotland, the marriage laws are different. You could get married from home, not necessarily in a church. So there is a higher percentage of best day dresses. Um, and we find that we are getting cream dresses coming in from the 1870s by the wealthier brides. The two cream dresses here, both uh, in one case, Jessie, Jessie on the left and Jessie in the center are from sh uh, shipbuilding families. Um, so I have a lot more. I haven't yet identified the bride on the right but it's led to that question in terms of how many of the other 
exa surviving examples of everyday dress is actually a wedding dress. It was a best day wedding dress, and that was the reason it was kept. But through the family generations, it's just been lost as being a wedding dress. Oops. Back. We've also got morning wear. Not a huge number, um, but I've put this slide in as well. As part of a civic collection, it means that I can make links across the collection. So we've got a fantastically strong collection of portraits, which helps with interpretation. Our decorative art collections have got a fantastic uh, Scottish jewellery, uh, morning jewellery, which is brilliant when it comes to putting them all together. Accessories, well, of course, museums have got accessories. A few early examples I've put in one of our lovely early Regency ones. A couple I've thrown in for Robin Thomas Carlyle's hat. Who knows whether it's the one in the Whistler portrait. Um, again, some of these had come in. I Most of us are probably coming in from descendants of the donors. Some of our fans were have come in from two smaller fan collections. One. Uh, passed on from the National Museum of Antiquities, now the National Museums of Scotland, and another set of fans that was collected by somebody who was serving in the Spanish Civil War and was given a percentage of Spanish and Portuguese fans as a thank you family heirlooms passed on as the gratitude and ended up in Glasgow. So say a lot of our work is linked to uh, Glasgow and surrounding southwest areas uh, in terms of department stores, dressmakers, and this is the focus of my work at the moment, not only cataloguing the collection, but trying to create biographical records. So here, this is David Kemp, who is second shop up on Buchanan Street, later taken over as most of them were by House of Fraser. And as well as the design, the tailors, the dressmakers, I'm also slowly trying to find out who the wearers were so that we can put that all the dresses back into their correct social class, social background. And this, this is where previously I had thought we had a very middle-class collection and I'm finding out more and more of our best day dresses are actually working class. I wouldn't cl classify it as working dress, but it is the Sunday best for our working classes. So how can you find out more? Well, um, as I ease back into being a curator, I'm trying to get back to our collections navigator. This is our online database where we have released the records. Um, we have released our historical documentation as well. So all, all the 20th century, the records are still a mess. I'm slowly working my way through the 19th century so that they have got consistent terminology. And there's a new set that I did earlier this year of collection level descriptions. And we are slowly adding the, what photographs we have at the moment, um, we're getting, trying to get back on. This is the way into the collection and we are reopening our appointment service this uh, autumn. We had to close through COVID and through the borough just took all our central services staff. So here's the screenshot to take. Here is our inquiry number and our collections navigator addresses if you want to find out more on get in contact with me, apart from catching me on Twitter. Kate, thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Um, oh, it is such a fantastic collection for anybody. There's just a bit of everything and, and I'm just an extra kudos to Becky because it's a frequent user of the collections navigator. It's the fashion section that's probably the best up to date. <laughs> forget the design objects but that's a whole other story so anyway thank you so much and I'm sorry that we've we've run over we had a little technical glitch at the start um but I hope people are able to stick around for some more questions I'm very happy to stay if our speakers are I'll hand it over to Anna if you want to catch us up on some of the questions that have come in yeah how far back should we go Robin because well, should we start with some questions for um Liz and if there's anything for Becky and then if we can go back a bit more generally if there's some time and people still want to engage okay so um the the okay so comments Veronica made the comment for Elizabeth that there is a, fam uh, a familiar look with uh, Henry Irving as Faust, so sort of thinking about the crossovers there, and Robin came in with, well, they would probably store that. And then Veronica's put in a link to Henry Irving as Mephistopheles in Faust, 
Mm -hmm. And for sorry, I'm a bit frazzled today. I'm a bit fried. I've been on the beach too much. I'm on holiday at the moment, and I'm yeah, I'm a little malfunctional. So Veronica's question was, she would be fascinated to know how they paid for these costumes. I mean, this is a huge pageant, an incredibly lavish thousand yeah. players, significant yeah. investment in research materials and making. How? <laughs> Yes, yes. Thank you. I can't get my image going, but I've got, I think you can hear me all right anyway, which is the main thing. Yes, over a thousand players. Well, and it was all organised in, well, really pra in practical terms in less than six months. There were working groups, some of them in children's shelters or children's homes. Women went there to make the costume. But fortunately, we know who supplied some of the materials. We know that the materials came from three main suppliers, Jenner's department store in Edinburgh, Malls, which later became Bins and later House of Fraser at the West End of Princess Street. And the third provider of costume fabrics was Cranston and Elliot. And we know that different theatrical companies became involved. There was the Edinburgh Theatrical Supply Company in Union Street in Edinburgh, and also the Lyceum Theatre, Howard and Wyndham at the Lyceum Theatre. So uh, they were providing some costumes they were making up, but uh, basically they were made by, well, a variety of different types of makers. There would be dressmakers who were taken on specifically to make them. There were amateur seamstresses and professional seamstresses who were working in the children's hospitals, children's schools and, and shelters. Um, and there is also among the archives that I've been looking at, thanks to Liz Lewis, who is with us today. She's part of the um, team here this afternoon. She is curator at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. And Liz very kindly put me onto the archives at National Records Scotland, which I looked at last Monday. And there is a directory there of various names of the great and the good who subscribed money to help finance all this. Uh, we know that uh, there were members of the aristocracy, the gentry, and the middle classes were pouring money into the making. So they, they would be paying the theatre companies, they would be buying the fabrics, but much of the actual making, I suspect, was done for absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. Professional seamstresses and uh, dressmakers would be paid, of course, to do it, and they would be paid by uh, the, the people who were stumping up the money, but I think much of it was amateur making, mm. amateur without any payment at all. Thank you. That answers. There have been a couple of questions on who actually put these extraordinary um, things together. I mean, why was 1908 such a, a bumper year, as it were? You know, what, what was the overriding remit for such a big one? Well, I think it followed the idea of the two Queen Mary pageants organised by the Waltons the previous two years. Um, also, the national exhibition planned for Socketon Park, which did happen, which is where the pageant did take place, but not through the grounds on the day. Um, they had proposed in late 1907 that there should be a series of pageants, small scale pageants, to bring some of Scotland's history to life. Mm. And then there was the agreement eventually and this only happened in the spring of 1908 that the passion should switch to be, to being performed during and at the exhibition rather than in the grounds of Donaldson's Hospital for the deaf. So I, th I think it was a combination of different things. They were aware of the, the whole pageant culture happening south of the border, if you like. And there had also been a whole, there were all kinds of mini pageants taking place all over Scotland before 1908. For instance, in 1907, we read in newspaper reports of a fancy dress cycle parade happening in the little <laughs> East Lothian town of North Berwick. And you imagine, unfortunately, we don't have any visual records of that, but you can imagine uh, cyclists whizzing along dressed as Mary Queen of Scots 
and <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth as well, it wasn't only Scottish characters. So dressing up was certainly part of the culture in Scotland already in the 1900s. So I think it was a combination of different factors coming into play. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And was it well received by the press? I mean, was it sort of seen as um, a celebration of Scottish culture and... Yes. Oh, yes. Great tub thumping, I think, here. <laughs> um, SNP, now yeah. as the Scottish National Party, has the same initials as the Scottish National Pageant. Um, do you think that as well? That's been perceived. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it certainly it was part of the uh, romantic nationalist movement, romantic nationalism, quite definitely. Um, you know, Celtic revival was already well underway in terms of um, design and art as well. I mean, John Duncan doesn't suddenly become an artist in 1908. He's producing all kinds of such mm -hmm. paintings before which link in. And um, Je Jesse... Jesse King as well. And the Glasgow style can be seen as staunchly Celtic, staunchly Celtic. Yeah. Can oh, I also just, you. could I just chime in? Because it occurred to me while you were showing it um, about the E.A. Walton and, and his time in London um, in Chelsea. Uh, he actually mm -hmm. was in London at the same time as the Healthy and Artistic Dress Union um, uh, pageants, the, the yes. living pictures. I, so not only am I sure that he went, I think you and I need to sit down with those photographs and see if he was maybe in it. Yes, yes, right. Well, <laughs> come and visit when you like. You I will. Come. The cast. I, I'm now. I'm. I'm convinced that they were in the cast. So that was fantastic. Did we have any for Becky? Do we have a question for Becky? Yes, we do. So, um, well, I I've kicked off with. What a wonderful collection of dress. Rebecca, do you have a personal favourite? Is the one that shouts out to you? Uh, it's tricky. No, as a parent, you kind of feel you shouldn't have favourites. <laughs> um, and and I am and I do tend to be that kind of the favourite is whichever period I'm currently working on, there'll be a top-notch one in there. I yeah. know in terms of uh people's favourite because the Lord Provost asked for a copy to, for dressing up in a pageant. And whenever it goes on Twitter, it was, always has so many likes. And it was the blue going away outfit I showed on the uh, last dress slide that was made for the daughter of a stockbroker here in Glasgow. Mm. Uh, There's lots of comments, amazing photos, what amazing work you're doing, putting it all together and making it available. And um, the garment and the photograph of it being worn side by side was just wonderful to see. I think everybody agrees on that. Yes, no, um, there aren't that many. That was a copy photograph that came in. I'm hoping that by publishing more of the wearer's details, that it'll be picked up by people doing their own family history research and they might get in contact and say, oh, actually, I didn't realise my cousin had donated Granny's dress. Hmm. Here's a photo of her wearing it or wearing something similar. It's the dream, isn't it? It is, yeah. Our, our mission is to connect the objects with people and places. So I feel that sort of part of my work really pays off. I think one of the key things that's that's come out um, today too is is about uh, well, we all know the power of collecting, and um, but equally that you know the 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 album that. Elizabeth has been so fortunate. This is her album that she's working on. And, and Kate knows how wonderful this is when you can find that thing um, and then own it and, and dig on it. And, and obviously, and then these things come into to museum collections. So I think that that's really exciting. I, I think it'd be really interesting to talk more about that. Like who's ha who has amazing finds in their own little personal collection that they've been able to work on because that's a huge privilege. Um, I don't really have a question about that. I was just thinking about that, like how lucky you guys are to have these things that you find and you work on or even as, or even have, um, you know, care of like Becky and, and, and Emily, obviously your babies, as you've just said. So that's been fantastic. Um, does anyone have any, do you wanna, anyone have any comments or questions? I, I'm mindful of how long we're running over, but I, I also don't wanna cut anyone off if you have something you're 
um, a burning question or something you'd like to chime in on. It's been fa absolutely fascinating. Okay. Well, with that, then I think we probably should wind this up. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for sticking around um, as we've run a bit over. But thank you, especially to our amazing speakers today.